I'm back in my office in Woburn and excited to be catching up with Chief Rufo from the police department. And of course, as always, Mayor Scott Galvin. Welcome, Scott. Uh, hi, Samantha. Good to be here. Good to have you back in the in the woo. In the I woo, say. yes. I was gone. Uh, I had a wonderful vacation, but it does feel nice to be home, even if it is hot and sticky out. Yeah. So um, lots of things going on in the city. I wanted to touch base on, I connected with Rich Haggerty earlier today because I know there's been some question about free lunches in the school systems across Massachusetts and it had been in budgets and out of budgets. I don't think it's officially passed yet, but he felt pretty optimistic that the, we will be able to offer free lunches uh, that will be funded at the, at the state level. Is that your understanding? Good news. Well? Uh, it's been that way, but that's good news if they've done that, yeah. Yeah, so today um, I think was the official vote. So we'll keep our fingers crossed, but I think yep. it, it was likely to pass. That's great. Great. Um, speaking of free things, I saw that there were several places in the city where free COVID tests were being given out. I thought that was such a nice thing. Tell us a little bit about how that started. Yeah, so we had um, originally, um, we the, there was an offer from the governor to get um, the at-home rapid tests uh, through the state on their contract we paid for those we got about uh jesus uh, let's say ten thousand kits and i split i split uh, a pallet with the mayor from marlboro and we were able to give them out back then and they ran out pretty quickly that was during the heat of covid the governors they they have a, a number of kits that they've been making available to uh, cities and towns and you know we were one of them we jumped on it uh the thing about these kits is when people don't need to be alarmed is uh, when they came out, they have an expiration date. It was June 30th of, of this year, but they've made a, um, you know, they made a medical decision that they are still good and they're good for, you know, I think for another three months or so. Uh, so we put stickers on them that were, that were given to us by uh, the Mass DPH to put over the QR code. So people, when they see it, they know what they're, when they're good to. So yeah, now we're giving them out. Uh, we've made them, we're giving out the rapid tests till they, Till they're given away, I've given given them to locations. I, I you know, we've given them to churches, we've given them to Boys Club, the Y. We're giving them out in my office up at the senior center, uh, over at the library and downstairs, of course, the Board of Health. And any anyone else who wants them, Samantha, that's why it's good. I'm glad you brought it up. Anybody else who wants them to distribute them if they're in a, uh, you know, a setting where they can give them out to uh, people who might not have access to city hall, we'd be happy to uh, get them to them. Any churches that we didn't reach out to or any other social organizations that have a, a good base that would like to give them out, we'd be happy to do that as well. That's great. Thank you for that update. It's nice to see those uh, resources being available for, for folks for easy access. Um, you were kind enough to send me the budget and I've started to go through it. I'm gonna have more questions for you next week. Um, That's but, good. But um, I really wanna give it its uh, due attention and um, there's lots of good stuff in there. Some good infrastructure increases to police and fire and all kinds of things is the capital budget that I was looking at. One thing I did notice I did wanted to ask you about today is, um, so there's a, a, a modest capital spend this year and then a really much more significant capital spend the two years that follows and then a, a more modest one. Yep. I was just um, wanted to understand why we've cycled it in that way. I'm sure there's, you know, good it's, reasons. It's kind that. of the way it's fallen, Samantha. And I think some of the, the mm -hmm. items you might be talking about that do tend to give it an unevenness. Uh, remember the, the PFAS is a big part of it. So that PFAS, the PFAS uh, is estimated to be a $20 million spend. And that's, that's one of the big expenditures you see out there. We all, uh, some of that will be by grant. Some will be by uh, um, the city taking on some debt, which hopefully will be no interest, but still it's an expensive proposition. Um, the other, the other big item was the, the downtown uh, safety plan, which is all totally funded by, Grant, so that's a sixteen million dollar project, and that's why that kind of looks it looks bigger out there. So those, it, you know, it, it takes a long time to to get used to it. And I'd be happy to kind of sit down with you before we come back on to show you how it's laid out. Uh, but what we generally do is the one thing we try to keep constant is the the um, annual appropriation we make by free cash. Sometimes they they do get smaller as the years get out, but we end up. You know, as we go, this five-year plan is always, uh, we always update it. And, uh, you know, one of the big things that I made sure to note is that the schools have a, uh, a study that they're going to be doing, and the, the, the bids are coming back for that now to, to employ a, a, um, an engineer slash architect who's going to help them go through the buildings and, and uh, 
point out some of the capital needs that they need for some of those buildings. And, you know, we've talked about this at the, uh, those new buildings that we're building are starting to, to age. And I always point to the reason it's, it's, it's 20 plus years. It's still a beautiful building, but there are, there are definitely things in there that are going to have to be updated. So. Yeah, thank you for that. I'll take you up on it. We'll, we'll schedule that so I can go through it in more detail. Yeah. I did. It, I actually found it. I really liked how it was laid out because it's easy to see what's a grant versus you know, sort of city funding and such. So um, lots of good information to sit through there, but um, having someone who knows what's all in there will be very helpful for me. So yeah. I'll definitely take you up on that. Um, a couple other little things. I'm just looking through my notes here. Um, you know, the only other thing I wanted to mention for folks, and this isn't really specifically from your office, Scott, but I think it's just, I noticed a really cool kite making class the library is offering this weekend. And I wanted to call it out because there were still some spots for it. And That's it looked great. like a really cool class. So I wanted to let yeah. folks know if they haven't signed up for it, they should go check that out. Yeah, they're doing a good job. Uh, and we talked about this last week. They're really, the program is starting to ramp up and um, the, the, um, level of interest over at the library is really picking up, which is where we want it to be. So we're happy about that. Yeah, me too. I know we're going to be getting together in person next week at Horn Pond, weather permitting to film. Um, and I had asked folks where else I should, you know, check out the city and do some live that we have the WPMC travel van. And of course, um, they suggested I come down to City Hall and and maybe meet some of the folks who work with you around. So maybe we'll talk about doing that. And this is like your own little zip trip, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta start, start hyping it up, and people will be, people will be coming down to get on camera. That's. A, I'm a good excited point. to have yeah. uh, the to help support this this the uh, WPMC and the van and all the hard work they do in that. The crew does an amazing job using the new. Yeah, it'll, it'll be it'll be great. Maybe we, if you want to, uh, you know, get like you said, get some other uh, other. I'm sure you already have your guests. Line yeah, line. I'm all, you know me, I'm always open. So we'll, we'll coordinate yeah. that. But anything else going on in the city before I introduce Chief Rufo and we talk about some of the stuff happening in the police department? Uh, no, I, I, you know, I, I think we're, um, you know, we're up to speed on most of the stuff. We'll go over the Capitol, you know, probably whenever you want, we'll go over, we'll go over that in more depth. The city council is just getting the hands on it. Tomorrow night, they'll get the hands on it. They'll send it to committee. So uh, if you wanted to preview it before they talk about that, that'd be pretty good. Yeah, you bet. Absolutely. We'll do that. Thanks, Scott, for joining us. As okay, always. good to see you. Appreciate see you, it. Chief. Thank you, man. So, Chief Rufo, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We were talking before the show that it has been far too long in between when we've chatted, so we won't let that happen again, but really glad that you're here. And Well, and thank you for having me. Yeah, and we have some good news to share. So um, I know that the police department received a grant, a Cummings grant, if I'm correct, around um, drones and investing yes. in that technology. I wanted to ask a little bit about how those will be used and, and how that came to be. Well, it, um, some of, of recent drone, drone technologies come in into law enforcement and it's proven to be very successful in a couple of the cities and towns around us. Uh, particularly, um, they've been very successful in search and rescue, and instead of sending multiple office in, offices into a particular area, a drone can be employed, um, searching an area, you know, much more quickly, and particularly with thermal imaging technology that we have in drones today, um, the ability to find and locate people in the darkness, or even not in the darkness, it, it, it's, it's fantastic. Um, People can be located and then send rescue personnel right to them instead of surrounding or inundating an area, you know, flooding an area with personnel to, with no success. The drones have been very successful. Um, it, you know, we, many times we've called the state police in the past for assistance for aerial surveillance and or assistance in location. When you look at flight times with upwards costs of $2,000 uh, $2, per hour minus personnel, there is just such a significant savings and they basically uh, can achieve the same thing. Um, found them to be very, very successful with road crash investigations, highway safety surveys, especially with surveys, you know, you can collect data in real time. And it, again, it, 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 it assists with that, but as well as mapping crime scenes. Um, certainly it's it's great for the preparation, monitoring of public events, uh, disaster response and assistance, and, and certainly last but not least, you know, crime scene investigations as well, particularly mapping of crime scenes. So there's a plethora of applications for it. Um, 
And, you know, we thank Cummings Foundation. They were, they were just great. So we've got that project moving forward and we're in the process now of looking at the different equipment, the different um, add-ons that go to the drone itself, as well as a vehicle that's dedicated just for the drone and the drone unit. So that is in process of being built right now. That's great. I was actually going to ask you about training because flying a drone, particularly one of this, takes some skill. You know, this isn't my kid in the backyard, you know, having fun chasing their dog, but um, this has a much more purposeful use and they're pretty sophisticated technology. So, well, you had to mention a unit, so there'll be sort of a dedicated group of people who get trained on it or how will that work? Yeah, right now we have uh, one drone pilot already. Um, there's a couple of us that have already taken courses um, towards drone pilot certification. Um, and it, it, you literally get a license that says FAA, your uh, remote um, aerial surveillance operator type of thing. Um, you know, many guidelines, particularly with our close proximity to Hanscom Field, um, if it is deployed on the west side, there is criteria that we have to live with that under as well as um, permitting and authorizations through the FAA for uh, Hanscom. Logan isn't as much of a problem because it is it, the proximity isn't as great, but because of the proximity to Hanscom, there there is different criteria. That's really I'm I'm I hadn't even thought about it in terms of finding people. I you know and so that is a you know we we do have folks who are, uh, occasionally go missing or such. So uh, glad to hear it will be used for that. Um, I want to talk about the Supreme Court decision that was recently made around license to carry and what that means for Massachusetts and specifically for Woburn. Um, some of the ruling does have uh, at least the appearance of an effect of how we can and license people to carry a, a firearm. And I wanted to just get an update from you about what changes, if any, are happening here in Woburn as a result of that case. Okay. Well, that case is the New York... Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. Uh, Bruin actually, he's a colonel of the uh, New York State Police. He would be the one responsible for licensing. They filed suit, which ultimately ended up in the Supreme Court appealing the, the restrictions in New York on the right to possess um, for personal protection, we'll say. Um, so it, the Supreme Court went right along the guidelines of the Second Amendment, which guarantees your constitutional right to carry or, you know, to possess firearms. Um, Massachusetts law isn't changing dramatically. The biggest change is, is the reason for issuing the license. So an issuing authority can issue it for no, with no restrictions, uh, can restrict it for sporting and hunting, um, things like that. The, right now, with this law, the restrictions that could have been placed on a license if a issuing authority chose to do so, that's no longer applicable. So when somebody applies for the license, we can't ask what they want it for. It just, it is whether or not you fit the criteria for the license. And it isn't even fit the criteria, it's whether or not the statutory uh, prohibitions that would preclude me from issuing a license to somebody. So if there are no statutory prohibitions, that person is issued a license. Um, it doesn't affect the FID law, that's entirely different. That is a shall issue law, um, unless again, this criteria that would prevent you from possessing the license. Um, this affects only the license to carry and only the restrictions on the license. That is it, which honestly makes our job easier as, um, you know, when somebody does come in and apply for it. But we, and just to, to be clear for folks, you, we still do background checks. You still have, um, if there's reason to withhold uh, yes. based on- Well, the statutory right. prohibitions that prevent me or any issuing authority from issuing a license, felony convictions, uh, state or federal drug convictions, conviction of a violent crime. Um, and, you know, people say, well, exactly. Well, it could be assault and battery, domestic mm -hmm. assault and battery, robbery, et cetera. Any of your, your very serious- dangerous crime felonies. Um, if there is nothing that will prohibit that, the only other issue would be whether or not somebody would be a suitable person not to be licensed. And that uh, there's certain criteria for that. But again, it generally falls within the statutory prohibitions for the license to carry. 
Um, I've seen the police department do some really good work at um, raising awareness around um, some of our residents or visitors who might have communication challenges, right? So, so folks who might be autistic or nonverbal or um, maybe just disoriented um, or suffer from dementia or, or something like that and, and raising words. Tell us a little bit about some of the, the ways that the department has been working to train staff to deal with those situations and just generally raise awareness? Well, we do have a program where somebody can actually um, inform of, us of somebody with particular special needs or communication issues. That goes into our log, in, not into our log, into our computer database. So that if we do get a call to that location, it'll immediately pop up on the screen that there is communication, you know, possible communications issues um, developmental issues or other issues that would be concerned with so that people pre can prepare as they begin their, their process of helping to assist or rectify whatever the problem is. Yeah, I think that's great. I know that that is a more recent effort in terms of being formalized. So it's nice to see that. And for yes. those who are watching, if you have family loved ones who might fall into any of these categories, you know, definitely register them, let, let the police department know so that they are able to best support your, your family and your Yeah, life. and if you have any questions on that, Captain Jolly um, sure. is pretty much taking the lead with that. So he can answer any questions you have or direct you to resources or just assist you in, in that process. That's great, I love that. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, uh, logs. So we in Woburn, we don't publish a periodic police log. Some cities do um, that sort of say calls that were, went on and, and you know information arrests made and things like that. And I've had some folks ask me to, to ask you why we don't publish one and is there any, um, any criteria by which you would consider doing that? Well, I mean, you, certainly people want to know they can re have a public records request. Certainly, we deal with those every day. Um, we do have a significant log. To do that every day requires personnel to do it. And frankly, right now, I cannot spare anybody to do that. Um, that we are more than open to public records requests, but to dedicate a sole person to do that, it, it's an arduous task right now. And we have honestly, we're trying to maintain positions and levels on the police department. And unfortunately, right now, we're maintaining attritional levels, and that's it. Um, certainly, as we grow, we would like to increase staffing. And that just, it's, it's proving to be a very arduous task right now. Uh, we did just get a civil service list that was released uh, July 5th. And there are more candidates on it. But when I tell you it's anemic, it's anemic. Um, in the past, we would have upwards of 250 residents that would take the exam. The last two exams, which were given back to back over the, la the last two springs, roughly 47 people. Wow, oh, that's a big difference. Yeah, we've got four people retiring in January. I've got four people graduating the police academy this week another one in a couple of weeks, but four leaving in January, another one leaving in uh, July 1st. So those personnel, again, the people that I've got, the getting out of the academy now, purely attrition. Um, it takes a few months for field training um, and to go through the process of actually becoming acclimated to working and becoming comfortable enough where they can go in the street on their own. That it bring us right to probably January. So again, backfilling just what we have. And, and it would be great to dedicate that. I mean, it, it, as I said, it's a significant log, but I, it just not, it's not feasible right now. Yeah, that makes sense. Are there open positions that we are not able to fill right now because we don't have enough candidates to fill them or are we just um, keeping pace with- the um, at, Again, purely attrition. Okay. I've got one officer that uh, will be retired August 1st. Um, I've got one in queue that's a reserve that's currently working full time. He'll take that position. Um, then, you know, in light of the one of the problems we have, we were always very blessed with the fact that we had a what we call a reserve police list. If people hired off the civil service exam, we train them as reserve police officers. You know, far less training regiment than the, the mm -hmm. dedicated 26 week academy, but it allowed us to have personnel that could work 
special events, put them on the street, augment what we have, supplement the square people and fill details. Well, in light of the post legislation, post eliminated reserves. So before a police officer can step foot on the street, they have to complete a 26 week academy. So that buffer that we always had of 15 or eight, up to 18 people, there were always at least 10 or 15, and we would fill it as those positions became available. That is no longer available to us. So we, um, in the last, especially the last year, we're constantly catching up to where we were. Um, special events like, for instance, when we used to have Flag Day, which is not existent anymore, we'll say, um, but like, <clears throat> excuse me, the Halloween parade, we would always have an additional 15 or 18 people that were more than willing to work. Again, the, that those are gone. So there, there isn't always people in the queue. The, the, the hiring and vetting process, it does take a considerable amount of time. You know, they do their normal physicals, PAT tests, psychological examinations, extensive background checks, and it takes, it takes a couple of months. So um, I actually just spoke to the mayor about it earlier, probably on the, just about ready to call for another list to get another four or five people prepared, get them into a police academy. You look at a lead time at minimum six months just for the academy, a couple of months for vetting, um, field training. You're looking at from the time that we'll call a list for active candidates, you're looking at one year. That's so a long time. it is, it absolutely okay. is. Um, thank you for sharing that. I don't think um, many of us know uh, the process behind that and, yeah, and how long it it's a so. it's a very long process. Okay. Um, this is a silly thing, but um, it is it has been quite the talk of the town. We had black bear sightings in Woburn, maybe the first time since I've lived here, I think, anyways, uh, in the last you know almost thirty years. Um, they've probably been around, but I haven't noticed. What do you uh, is is it as uncommon as I think it is? Uh, well, it's not that common. It has occurred in the past. Um, so right now we've got a black bear that's roaming around North Woburn to Wilmington. Um, just a, a couple of things in that. Right now it is, it's, we're probably at the very end of the bear mating season, which would suggest to me it's probably a juvenile male that's been pushed out of territory that he was in. Um, their most common seeking is for a female, but it also is, they're very food driven. Um, so a couple of things that I would suggest, if you have bird feeders, take them down. They are very, very cunning animals and they will get to them. Um, if you have gas grills or grills outside, make sure you clean them, covering, always covering them. Um, secure your trash. I wouldn't put trash out or garbage out until the night before the, the garbage delivery. And the bottom line is leave them alone. They're, they're, they're not generally speaking an aggressive animal. But if you happen to come across a female with cubs, they're very, very protective, as you would expect. Um, and the juvenile males, as I believe this one probably is, and again, it's my it's speculative, but based upon the time of the year, it is probably in, in the size, probably a juvenile male that was pushed, as I said, pushed out from a territory and into a new one, and he's looking to make friends. So yeah, <laughs> and you don't want to make friends. Uh, is there well, not, not with humans. Idiot? No, no, um, we definitely want to, we have, um, as many of the audience knows, I have a house in New Hampshire in addition to my home here in Woburn, and we have a lot of black bears that we, not a lot of them, but we, it's quite common, we're in the woods and the lake, and they're around, and the things you describe, are, we, we don't put trash out, we, birds, you know, the bird feeders, it's amazing what a black bear will get into, uh, no matter how high up it is, they do climb trees, they, they can get to them, and they, and they like the bird seed, so. They're fast runners, and they're consummate climbers yeah so, so um if there is a sighting do you know should people continue to call it in or only if there's like a disruption to you know that they're, it's doing something to indicate perhaps that it is dangerous to, to I, I mean if i would say if it exhibited any aggressive behavior certainly give us a call at that point i i we would probably call the environmental police and they, they will come out at the drive you know very very quickly um but again i mean my advice would be to pretty much leave them be, don't antagonize it. Um, you know, there's some people that might say, well, I'll try to scare them away. They will go. If there isn't a food source mm -hmm. and there isn't somebody to be friendly with, they're not gonna stick around. Um, but they are very resourceful and they're very cunning animals, so. Yeah. 
Yeah. Know, they, they, any they, aggressive they, behavior, certainly okay. give us a call. No question. Okay, good. That's good guidance. I love it. Last thing I wanted to ask, and this might be a resource issue as well. So um, we, there's been a lot of, um, we see motor vehicle goggles and things that happen all the time everywhere. That's very normal. Um, there isn't a lot of enforcing of speeding laws in Woburn. So there's a, you know, a lot of people who um, uh, see people, you know, being, you know, fast. We certainly have seen police respond to people um, messing with school bus pickups and drops offs and things like that. But generally speaking, not a lot of people are going to be pulled over for speeding and ticketed for doing that in the city. Is that a resource issue or is there another reason we don't see more of that happening? No, we actually, we have a dedicated traffic bureau that their, their entire function is traffic enforcement and or assistance, you know, with accidents. Um, Woburn is 12 and a half square miles, and there is a tremendous amount of traffic, particularly during the day. Um, we have people that work days, evenings, um, and, and they're spread out pretty much everywhere, but there is, a, it's a city, and during the day, our numbers bloom, we'll say, and okay. there is a tremendous amount of traffic, and you can only do so much. In time, would I like to see the traffic bureau staffing increased? Absolutely. But again, right now, it's I don't have the capability to increase the traffic bureau, and it would be great. Sergeant Stokes run at this office of Simons, Mantone, Gately, and Pacheco, dedicated offices. That's all they do. And again, it, it you know, no matter where you go, there is potential traffic problems or speeding, um, and they are very, very astute and aggressive. Um, in a, but unfortunately, I, we definitely had a setback during the pandemic because there was very, I don't want to say very little enforcement, but there was a reduced amount of enforcement and people became far more aggressive drivers over the last two years. Um, but they're at it, they're at it every day and they do a great job. And, and again, you, you, you can only do so much. Yeah. And but obviously rest assured, we are aggressive at it. Yeah, that's good to know. And, you know, look, they have to put their priorities in the areas, you know, preventing really dangerous driving. Speeding is a factor, but not the only factor in that. So um, a lot of work for those those four people to do. Um, this has been so helpful. Before I let you go, anything that you want in general, the community, it's summertime, most students are not in school right now, it's hot, it's, you know, lots of outdoor time, which is great, but anything that you want the community at large to keep in mind and help keep each other safe? Well, I, you know, if they, the, the best advice that we can give is if you see something, say something. Um, and that's what, you know, if you're having a problem with, you know, a neighborhood issue or constant parties or noise, call us. The best thing you can do is call the non-emergency line, 781-933-1212. A lot of people resort to the use of Q, you know, they use Q alert. That's great for certain things. Um, it's not monitored in real time. And the real time is the calls we receive that receive immediate police response. So if you see something suspicious, if, you know, again, it, it comes down to if you see something, say something. Um, and, you know, enjoy your summer. It's been a great summer. And um, again, it, it, most of our crimes, a lot of the solving of our crimes are based upon what people see. So if, if you see something and something's registering that says that might not be right, call us. We have no problem with it. That's great. Thank you so much for joining us. Certainly. And thank you well, thank you for having me. Yeah, the, the whole team, it, you know, this is hard work. Um, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We know that people are out there patrolling. We see them all the time doing lots of things. We see a lot of things that we don't see that happens behind the scenes. And we're grateful for the folks who choose to do that and, and dedicate their time to this work. So thank you. And as always, Woburn, please continue to take good care of each other.